Good evening, St. Paul Public School staff. I'm Superintendent Joe Gothard and grateful that you're spending some time either live with us tonight or that you're watching this sometime in the future after we post tonight's conversation. I'm grateful to those of you who submitted questions for us to uh, share in discussion tonight with you. And uh, we'll go through this and I've got several members of our team that are joining me tonight to, to help share uh, some of their expertise and some of the work that they've done with you and, and with others in the district as, as we get through tonight's questions. I think I'd like to start with just uh, my gratitude to you and my thanks for um, all that you've endured throughout this year. Um, it would take me far more than an hour to go back in time and, and replay everything that we've been through as a community this last year. Um, it has been extremely challenging, um, and yet even within those challenges, I have found so many times to be proud of you, uh, proud of the work that you're doing, um, the uncertainties that you've faced, uh, some of the uh, present dangers and, and work around uh, COVID-19 and the care that you've expressed to your colleagues, to your students, to your families, uh, to your communities. Uh, it really means a lot and it isn't lost on me as an individual, as a parent in the district and, and certainly as the superintendent. Um, I'm really proud of you and I know that in this time there's been uh, so much um, criticism and uh, desires and uh, decisions that have been made or haven't been made and you know, everybody seems to have a different way that they're um, that they feel about many of the things that, that we faced. Um, just know that we'll get through this together. Um, it hasn't been easy and there may be some difficult days ahead as we continue, uh, but just know that I really believe in us as a collective, as a district, as a community, uh, that we can get through this together. Um, I, I really do. I, I do feel like there are better days ahead of us. I understand and right before I haven't even been able to read much about it, but I do understand Governor Walls is going to uh, make some announcements tomorrow morning. That would be the 12th if you're not watching this live uh, Friday morning um, about continued uh, ways of dialing back some of the, the measures and restrictions that have been in place. And, um, you know, I think that that again uh, says that, that we're doing a far better job as a community and we've got a lot of work to continue to do so that we can do a great job as a school district and school community as well. So again, I want to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, uh, we'll get through some questions momentarily, but first I'd like the members of my team who are joining tonight to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Hans Ott, Executive Director for Digital and Alternative Education. Nice to see you all. Good evening, I'm Jim Vollmer. I'm the Assistant Director of Employee and Labor Relations with Human Resources. Hello, I'm Kathy Kimani. I'm the Director of the Office of School Support. Hello, I'm Marcy Dowd. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Specialized Services. Hello, I'm Mary Langworthy. I'm the Director of Health and Wellness. Good evening, I'm Stacy Gray Achea, and I am the Director of Research, Evaluation and Assessment. Good evening, my name is Stacy Copen. I am the Director of Nutrition Services. All right, and I think that is everyone. And staff, as you can see already, sometimes mute button stick, and I'm sure that's never happened to any of you. So let's get through, uh, let's start with tonight's questions. The first one, and again, thank you so much for those of you who submitted, is from Josie Pineda Johnson at Ramsey Middle School. My question is related to food services and lunchtime. I'm wondering what it will take to provide a hot lunch to students in the building during their time here. And I'm also wondering why we can't call a snack a snack. Currently, my middle school has decided on the cold lunch to go to option, lunch to go option for four and a half hours in the building with growing teenagers who need more food or snacks throughout the day, but we're having, uh, but we are unable to provide it. I believe the lack of food and snacks could have negative effects on focus, behavior, energy, and productivity, among other growth related concerns. Director Colbin. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Yes, thank you again. And I do appreciate these questions about nutrition because uh, obviously it's very near and dear to my heart. And I hope that you all know too that you know our ultimate goal is to get fuel to our kids so that they can learn. That is most important. Uh, as far as you know, when we're talking about snacks versus breakfast or lunch, you will often hear our nutrition team members, including myself, uh, really honing in on those words because we are really referring back to 
our industry terminology from the United States Department of Agriculture. So if it seems like a little bit picky about that, it's because uh, by definition, the USDA includes uh, or defines a snack as two food items that are served together, such as maybe an apple and a milk. Breakfast is four items and lunch is five items. So that's sort of why we uh, transition through that terminology. As for the lunch program, we do have a hot or a cold option that's available or a combination for schools. Uh, for Ramsey Middle School, I was in contact actually with the principal and I know that she's been very thoughtful about this. The Ramsey administrative team sent out a survey to staff which closes today to collect more feedback. So the decision has yet to be finalized, but the administrative team there is intending to use further collaboration to make that final plan as to what mill services would look like at Ramsey Middle School. All right, thank you, Director Colpin. The next question is from John Horton, teacher at JJ Hill Montessori. How has the pandemic altered, changed, or helped reimagine the district's strategic plan? What lessons did we learn and what are some of the things we will do as a district differently moving forward? Mr. Horton, uh, thank you for, for sharing uh, that your question. And, and first, I'd be remiss by not expressing congratulations to you and to your colleagues, Eugenia, Eugenia Polpa at Harding High School and Kathy Romero at Como Park Senior High School. Uh, you three are, twenty, are three of the 25 semifinalists for the Minnesota State Teacher of the Year. And uh, uh, we congratulate you for uh, that great accomplishment and wish all three of you luck as you move forward in the, in the final selection that I believe is due in May. So I think as you asked this question about what did we learn, what have we learned from the future? Um, we have spent so much time adapting in real time uh, to meet the needs of this challenge. I think there's many things that we're going to be able to draw on moving forward. Um, and that list is going to be long and lengthy. And I should also say that that list should not be from how I see things. It definitely has to be um, what have we experienced as a district and as a community that can help us uh, move forward in the future. There are some things that I've learned from a business and operations standpoint, though, that I think are worth sharing. The first is, uh, that we no longer use paper time cards. Uh, we had to automate the way that we record time and enter time in the district. And uh, for me, that was one of the goals I had um, after about my third month in the district. And I said, how come I sign these every week? And understanding that we just weren't quite there as a district yet. I do think it's very important that we um, have an automated time system for many, many reasons. Um, and we've been forced to do it and have been pretty successful, I believe. Uh, that's also a great time for us to think about other cloud functions that we have in the district, and we are underway with the launch of a PeopleSoft update to our entire system. The way that we do business and operations in the district will change and uh, will be far more advanced with the tools that are available today. And, and again, I think this time has forced us to, uh, to discipline ourselves in new ways and think about how we might use that, uh, not as a tool that we have to go in to do things, but a tool where we can optimize um, efficient systems and, and be effective with how we use systems throughout the district. Um, and I think uh, that'll be a, a great thing as we move through this year. It's a little bit over a year with that uh, total um, upgrade and, and, and plan that's in place. Uh, many of you are also aware that our Board of Education recently approved our application to the Minnesota Department of Education to host an online school. So that conversation, uh, many might think it started because of COVID-19 and the pandemic, but it didn't. It actually began, well, far before, but really with a reorganization in October of 2019. And one of the reasons uh, for, for doing that was for a team to come together to create an online school. We just had no idea that just a few months later, we'd be forced into distance learning and, and, and be forced to, to use an iPad or a device for, for all of our functions. Um, so again, what we're talking about in terms of an online school is quite different than virtual learning. Of course, there are applications and, that will um, lend themselves to, to what an online school looks like, but in terms of how it's operated, you know, being a separate school um, and being very specific for the educators that are um, that are assigned and that are that are working and teaching in that environment, and of course, the students and, and families who opt for that option as well. Uh, so that is definitely one thing where I think um, our, our district will be in a far different position, um, standing that school up and, and building that school and making it a part of the portfolio of options uh, that people have, that students have, that families have uh, for St. Paul Public Schools. 
So the other thing is that, uh, as I mentioned, we will have continued opportunities to draw on what we've learned from this year. And I don't know that I'm in any place right now at this moment to, to do that, honestly. And I would imagine many of you are in that in that same uh, space as well. I do believe moving forward that um, you know we uh, will continue to draw on this time and, and learn from it. Um, you know there there be plenty of things that we don't want to remember, and that's fine too. Um, but again, I, I I do believe that we'll be able to um, to you know look at our strategic plan and to think about the way that we support uh, your work, our work, what we want for our students, and be able to really. Um, do better. I also urge you to continue to, to please reach out to me. I'd like to hear what ideas that you have about what you've learned from your experiences uh, that you believe we could draw on for the future. And I think one thing that we've learned is that, you know, the it's it's limitless in terms of what we want to do. It's a matter of how can we support it. And, and I think the other thing is that if we really want to say this is what we're about and this is what we want to do, we have to be able to sustain it. Um, so that we can really develop the kind of depth and expertise and deliver the kind of outcomes that we want for our students and for, for our families. It's very important to me and I'm sure it's very important to all of you. Uh, so I do appreciate uh, the discussion about the future and what have we learned. Uh, believe me, this is a discussion that's come up in multiple places that I've spent uh, time in with, with other colleagues, both uh, here and far, and, and know that I, I do believe it's, uh, it's a great uh, discussion for us to have ongoing. Uh, any members of the team, would you like to contribute to what we've learned and how we might build that into the future? Dr. Gothard, uh, I, I can add that from an instructional standpoint, it's been amazing to see the educators uh, leading for how to meet students' needs in a unique environment. And we've been working uh, with the uh, uh, support of our community for now since 2012 on the personalized learning through technology. And though the technology has been in the hands of our staff and students, uh, there's been a lot of opportunity for growth over the last year. And we've really um, been able to hear from staff, hear from students as well, what makes online learning better. And uh, we're constantly applying that to the guidance we provide out of academics and from our digital and alternative education office. I appreciate everyone's uh, patience as we've gone through this, and we will only see that grow and grow and grow as uh, we move forward with digital education. And uh, there, there's been a number of ways we've learned to reach kids in new and unique ways. And we've heard some voices of students now that we weren't hearing as much in the classroom, and now we are hearing them uh, virtually and on the latter, the other side. So there's work to be done yet, but many lessons learned. Thank you, Hans, I appreciate that. OK, I'm going to move into a question from um, Elizabeth Sanbi in our Indian Education Program. Why are schools and programs not allowed to purchase their own our own air purifiers? Um, very few rooms uh, have uh, qualify for an air purifier provided by SPPS. And we've been told that we are not allowed to use the school or program funds to purchase air purifiers for rooms that do not qualify. Um, kind of talking about the equity, some PTOs and other entities are uh, providing resources so that schools can can buy them and I, I do understand that and it is something that actually came uh, to me today as well for us to to look into uh, but I wanted to share with you what director parent shared with me he couldn't be with us tonight uh, but I did ask him for uh, to, to share some perspectives um, first you can find lots of information on the reopen website about how the facilities team is trying to reduce the risk of coronavirus transmission through our improved indoor air quality it is complex and multifaceted and, and how that is done and all automated for that matter as well. Please know that supplemental air purifiers are not critical to ensure adequate ventilation system mitigations and every space that is used for teaching is supplied with fresh filtered air through the mechanical system. In any space where there is any historic air sampling data that indicates the mechanical system may not be able to provide the level of fresh filtered air that we could or that we would like in the district We've already purchased in place supplemental HEPA air purifiers out of an abundance of caution. And again, I urge you to reach out to that team in particular. If you have continued concerns or questions, uh, we have an indoor air quality team uh, in the district and they are incredible and responsive. And they have really put us in a position uh, to have what we believe is the necessary mitigation uh, for air purification and ventilation in our buildings and in those cases where we don't or there's an area identified uh, then we will take the proper steps to ensure that that's taken care of 
The next question is from Amanda Perna on Cherokee Heights. What can we do for children who are not wearing masks? The child I'm thinking of refuses to wear one much of the day, um, has, doesn't have a reason for not wearing one. Uh, we've been told that all we can do is encourage him. There has to be more that we can do. Say staff and children have high levels of anxiety due to non-compliance of mask wearing. I'd like Kathy Kamani to please share some information with you tonight. Good evening. Um, thanks for that question. Um, we did anticipate that there would be students that um, struggled with keeping um, their mask on during the school day um, and know that there are many students that are being successful in doing that. Um, so in general, we always want to take a preventative, educational and restorative approach to any type of behavior that interferes with learning. And this really means that we want to be proactive and student centered to develop some positive interventions that will increase your students compliance in their ability to wear the mask throughout the day. And so the first step would be, I know you're already mentioned in your question that you are encouraging that student and probably giving some real positive feedback when you see that they are wearing the mask. Um, but I think we want to work to also attempt to identify just why. What's the why behind that behavior and why are they refusing to wear that mask? And even go as far as to be reteaching not only how to wear the mask, but also why in a developmentally appropriate way in words that make sense to the child, but why are they wanting, but why they need to wear that mask. So I would encourage any educator to reach out to their um, staff that they have in the, their building that can help them with that. So reaching out for the support of their counselor or social worker to help develop a positive behavior intervention plan um, that might include things like um, the fact that most kids might want to be more likely to wear a mask if they have a mask that they like or they choose. Um, is there a trusted adult in the building that would check in with that student throughout the day? And like I mentioned, and you're probably already doing, giving that feedback when they do wear the mask, even if it's for a small amount of time. I know that it can be tempting to go to kind of the punitive places, especially when there is real anxiety of others that are um, might be impacted by not wearing the mask. But really, as a district, we really are discouraging using any um, kind of out of school suspension for refusal to wear a mask, but really want to um, instead partner with families and the student support teams we have in our buildings to try to address those issues. Thank you, Director Kamani. Donna Luciano, Battle Creek Elementary. Why are middle and high schools only going to school for four and a half hours a day and Fridays off? I asked members of our school team to contribute to this response. So districts throughout Minnesota were provided the autonomy to determine what in-person would look like. Our secondary design team, which is comprised of site leaders, SPFE representation, and numerous district departments believed it was very important to provide an instructional in-person opportunity for students that would allow for the highest degree of continuity of student to maintain their same teacher, continuity of students keeping the same schedule of classes, continuity of students staying within their same school, and the ever so important continuity with maintaining the relationships students and educators have developed this year. Our four and a half hour schedule allows for the continuity that we believe is so important for students and staff. The hours also allow us to be very intentional about separating the doing two job concerns that many districts are experiencing with their teachers. By designing our schedule, we provide an intentional time for our students who opted for virtual learning to maintain continuity of their teachers, course offerings, and remain connected to their same site. Our in-person schedule allows our secondary system to support the scheduling complexities, complexi complexities, as well as maintaining the individual identified continuity we believe is important for both in-person and virtual learning students. By using a four and a half hour day, we do not only allow our virtual learners to have synchronous time each day, we also allow our in-person to be on site for four days a week rather than two to three days like many hybrid models. And I think another important thing uh, for us to, to add to that is that, you know, we have a lot of, and especially at our high schools, a lot of single courses. Uh, so the opportunity for us to create a mirrored experience in a virtual learning site with a teacher who is either in person or to create virtual learning sections 
uh, we do not we did not have the ability to do that and to do that well. Uh, we do not have an on an online school, nor would we have an online school at this time that would be equipped to handle the schedule volume uh, that our students have, have chosen uh, for their courses. Some of them being uh, electives, of course, but many of them being required for graduation as well. So we felt it was very important for us to create a schedule that would allow our students to stay in their school with their teachers and uh, give the opportunity to do both and, and to do them uh, in, a, in, in the least restrictive way possible. So again, the Friday off is, is, a, is a day for, for planning, getting ready. It's also a, plan, a day to, to check in with students to make sure they have what they need to be successful. And it's a very common schedule right now as well um, around the Metro. Um, in terms of the four and a half days, the only thing I would add, I don't think I mentioned it in there, but some of our bus and transportation schedules as well, um, the different shifts that we have, um, you know, we're, we're not able to follow uh, just the regular schedule. So the staggers that we have in our start and end times um, are also very important for our transportation schedule. Colleagues, I don't know. I think I'm going to move on to the next one so we can get through as many of these as possible. <clears throat> Will there be a virtual learning school program offered K through 12 next year, 21-22? Thank you for the question. At the January, uh, one of the January board meetings, the school board approved our application to the state for a comprehensive online school for our 9th through 12th graders uh, that we are to begin enrolling this spring and also for the option to provide a K through 12, or in this case, K through eight, supplemental online program for all of our uh, students in St. Paul Public Schools. So we are planning for both uh, groups of students to have an, a, a defined SPPS online school for ninth through 12th graders that uh, will be open to students in St. Paul Public Schools and the neighboring adjoining districts. And then we are also preparing for our K through eight learners to be ready to uh, enroll uh, as they see fit for the fall in a full-time online program. And those are for our students inside uh, St. Public Schools. So we look forward to both those options and appreciate the collective input we've had from the teacher, principal, and district administrator planning teams to, to make that happen. Great, thank you, Mr. Ott. I'm a high school uh, teacher writes, if I have an official COVID-19 ADA from Human Resources. Will it be assumed that I'm going back with the rest of the staff in my school on April 12th, or am I exempt from returning? I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Vollmer to please respond. Certainly, thank you. Uh, we've been getting that question quite a bit actually in Human Resources. Uh, the way we have to address those is on a person by person, uh, individualized basis. So over the next course of the next couple of weeks, uh, Human Resources will be reviewing those, working with our uh, principals in our buildings, uh, seeing uh, what, what we can do or what we are unable to do with those. We will then be getting uh, notices out to employees if there is a change uh, to that accommodation and also if there is, uh, it stays the same. So we're going to be going through that. Uh, it'll be over the course of probably the next couple of weeks. A lot of buildings, a lot of principals to get scheduled and to visit with, uh, lots of uh, paperwork to look through, but we will be doing that in the next couple of weeks and then getting notices to folks um, as to whether there is a change or whether it's uh, their status is going to remain the same. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vollmer. The next question is from Sherry Kempf, uh, the Center for Equity and Culture at Washington Tech. Knowing that many families and students will travel over spring break, why are you not waiting for the recommended quarantine period to bring secondary students back in person? Uh, before I turn it over to Mary Langworthy in our health and wellness uh, department, um, I'll just say that I, I want our students back in school and to delay any further after spring break, you know, leaves us, a, leaves us with just a few weeks before the end of the school year. It's very important to me uh, that our students get back and we get a semblance of uh, what in-person learning is uh, right following spring break and following the two planning days. Mary, do you want to talk a little bit about the recommendations from our officials as well? 
I will, thank you. Um, so at this time, travel is still discouraged. Um, and so if people are choosing to travel, we're hoping that they are traveling with some um, good caution and care. Um, either going to somewhere new may expose either yourself or other people, depending on what the case rates are in that community. Um, so careful travel if you are going is really advised where you're trying to avoid people, social distance and isolate as best you can. Do testing before you go and after you return. Um, um, and certainly if you're sick or if any family member is sick or has tested positive, then we would ask that employees would make a report to our COVID system and stay home. Great, thank you, Mary. Next question is for Molly Brown, sixth grade teacher at Washington Technology Magnet. What is the plan for state testing, specifically MCAs? If students are to take their MCA test when returning to the building in quarter four, how are we making it equitable if virtual students don't have to take them? It seems like students returning to the building are being punished by having to take the test. And Dr. Gray Achea is here to share about your question, Molly. Good evening again. Um, thank you, Molly, for the question. It does give me an opportunity to clarify a couple of things around the MCA, um, which is our state assessment um, that is required. One is that it's a federal decision if we are to administer our state assessment MCA. Um, we don't have flexibility right now with the state, and so it is the expectation that we administer the MCA to all of our students um, as a district. Um, and that leads me to the second point, which is that virtual learning school is an option for the learning model, and that students are, that are enrolled in VL, uh, VLS are still expected to take the MCA. Um, our guidance for that is that students will take the MCA at their um, school of enrollment um, and that communication will be going out very soon to families. Um, and that leads me to my third point, which is um, the, the concept of opting out, which has existed in prior years and will continue to exist. And the option of opting out of, a, of the MCA or another assessment is given to families without regard to the learning model. So like in past years, um, families that are in person as well as in virtual learning will have the option to opt out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chao. Next is Christine Zapetta, Lee Clerk at Cherokee Heights. Uh, Christine has questions about COVID protocols around attendance, the process for students to return following illness, possibly, or related to COVID-19, how parents return their child to school following the COVID-19 protocols, and overall concerns that the protocols are not being followed on buses at lunch and in keeping distance. And Christine, first I want to acknowledge, um, you know, when I first read your question, um, I, I thought back to people like, Chris, Cheryl, Vera, um, Deb, uh, Gretchen. Uh, these are all lead clerks that I worked very closely with in buildings. And the, the central role that you have in coordinating what is seemingly everything um, is not lost on me at all. The vantage point that you have and the interactions that you have with all in your community um, really do make us look at or make me look at your question and, and really think carefully uh, about what you're sharing with, with me and with us tonight and want to be able to provide you as much uh, support and information as possible. Um, so I do want to have Mary Langworthy address uh, some of the concerns that you have. Uh, I also have uh, Kathy Kamani is on our call as well and perhaps can talk about some of the attendance uh, issues that you brought up. Uh, so I'll turn it over to them. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Gothard. Um, Christine, I'm happy to fo follow up with you individually as well to go into more detail. But in general, I wanted to provide some over, um, overarching information as well. That participating virtually today, the PVT code that we now have in attendance was really a partnership with many people within the district as a way to help identify students that should not be on site for various reasons. It may be that they've tested positive for COVID, that they are sick, or they have a family member that's sick or tested positive. Um, and in order to protect privacy, we really wanted to try and look at a way that would identify someone that should not be on site without disclosing too much information. Um, we recognize, as Dr. Gothard mentioned, the complexity of your role this year and the complexity of all of our roles this year. It's, it's a very complicated, tiresome many days to manage a variety of pieces that are in our laps. So thank you first and foremost for all of you do and all of the work of the clerks in our district. It is very complicated. 
The hard part with the PVT code is it may change, the dates may change. We um, have a very strong COVID team of nurses that are working regularly every day to exclude both employees and students. And the situations may change where that exclusion date might need to shift because of various situations. Maybe it, we're waiting for a test result to come back. Maybe a test result came back and it was positive or negative. Maybe they have a large family and because of that, there's multiple people that we're looking to see who's getting sick, who isn't getting sick, um, and having to quarantine multiple times and then change dates accordingly. Um, our campus tool, the attendance code, is our most effective way to be able to communicate out that information about who should be there, who shouldn't. And the hardest part about that is it can change and it may change frequently and, and that's hard, but it's going to be the best way for us to be able to share that timely information with people. Um, so I appreciate the work that you do and all of our clerks or other attendance leads do in updating that information. It's really vital that we do that. Um, it's not a perfect system and we recognize that, but we want to make sure we used a tool that already existed. Um, and then as far as COVID reporting, um, we have had a mandate with a safe learning plan that we provided an opportunity for people to make reports to SPPS so that we knew when people had tested positive, had close contacts or were, or were sick. Um, we chose this summer to really develop a very thorough online reporting system to streamline the process, to make it more consistent for people, and then to have a team of people that could respond in a very consistent manner and make all of the linkage, linkages we needed to do both for employees with payroll and HR and for students with the school. Um, and it's a very complicated system and we've updated it throughout the process. The hardest part is we can't control every piece of it. We have to rely on our employees, our students, our families to make honest reports to us. And we know sometimes they aren't. And I can't control all of that. What we can control is we can educate and inform and encourage and support any um, people that are having difficulties in making those reports. We can assist with language line or interpreters to help support our families that have language barriers, um, but we can work collectively together to try and encourage reports. And no, it's not about shaming people, but really about protecting people together collectively. Um, so it's not perfect, I acknowledge that, but I think it's a really good step to manage all of that. Since August, we've had over 3,600 reports to that system, which is pretty amazing that we built that, started it in August, and now we have over 3,600 reports. So it is working. It's not every report we want, but it's a lot of them. Um, and so that's helped reduce our spread and to be able to keep our schools open. Um, the last point, COVID testing. I know you mentioned some barriers for people. Um, just want to remind people there are local community test sites. They are free. Um, there's online ordering free test kits that that's a regular option and if there's barriers for people we want to help support that. We're also trying to work with Ramsey County to potentially offer some local testing sites regularly at a St. Paul Public School parking lot knowing that we'll have full in person at all levels and we have a very large district with a lot of people so we'd love to be able to support that better. Great, thank you so much, Mary. <clears throat> Next question is from Halita Her, Phelan Lake Hmong Studies, uh, fourth and fifth grade teacher. What is the district doing to hold parents and students accountable for attendance and virtual learning? Having parents and students check in themselves for attendance has not worked. Students mark themselves present, but do not log in to learn or attend Google Meets at all. There have been students we have not seen all school year long. What are we doing as a district to address this? This is not a responsive strategy. We are in fact failing our students. The district has set them up for failure. I am upset beyond words as an educator. What are we doing to address the virtual learning attendance issue? Where is the parent accountability? Where is the district accountability? How do we hold our students accountable when the district has below standards for attendance policy? Do we not have a higher standard as a district? So thank you for asking a question about attendance. I um, Attendance is one of my um, 
favorite things to talk about. And I have the privilege to work with our School Attendance Matters team. And we spend quite a bit of time um, also talking about how concerned we are about the attendance during, during distance learning and virtual learning. And um, the first thing is to know that we, we did um, set up the check-in process during vi virtual learning really to make it um, accessible for families to access learning whenever they could to accommodate a lot of different schedules, knowing that all families could not engage in distance learning during the typical school hours. So knowing that we do have students that are not attending regularly, um, you know, we do hope that and expect that every school has an attendance team and school teams are continuing to reach out to families um, of students that are not attending regularly synchronous sessions or that haven't submitted work. And the goal is really not only accountability, but really about addressing some of the barriers to consistent attendance and engagement with schools. Um, so I kind of say, like to compare it to students that usually come to school when we were in school physically. So they might come to school every day, but they're not completing their work. It's not only an attendance issue, but really an uh, engagement issue. So I really am hesitant to take a punitive or harmful approach to this issue, but really want to support interventions that I know attendance teams and some of my colleagues and school counselors, social workers are doing, doing interventions like home visits, referrals to community agencies, referrals to the school's mental health support team or student assistance team to check in on those students and families. So like I mentioned, our School Attendance Matters team, they have been working throughout distance learning, and those are St. Paul School staff that partner regularly with the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. And um, we have a full-time social worker, Janine Hoyer DeVries, that is the contact or liaison for elementary schools. And although both St. Paul Schools and Ramsey County Attorney's Office are very hesitant to engage in any court petitions um, to criminalize, that will criminalize families or students for attendance concerns during a pandemic, we are continuing to partner with them on um, lower level types of meetings called student attendance review team meetings. And so school teams are able to refer those to Janine and it is a joint meeting um, between our school district and the Ramsey County Attorney's Office with a family. And the focus is not punitive, but it is about what's getting in the way of regular school attendance and really explaining and um, communicating how important every attendance every single day is and putting together a plan that would help that student attend more. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. And again, I encourage anyone to follow up with our School Attendance Matters team. Um, it, it would, they're a great resource and, and again, have some specific strategies that have been effective during this really difficult time. The next question is from Tammy Otto, a teacher at Chelsea Heights. How can we possibly make sure that MCAs are administered in a fair and equitable man way between our distance learning and in-person learners? Uh, I'm back and already seeing the discrepancies in some of our fast testing scores taken from home. Um, and Dr. Che, if you wanna add, I don't know if you covered this in your previous response, but uh, if you have anything to add, please do. Sure, I would just quickly say that um, this does give me the opportunity to um, reiterate that um, we are um, expected and um, required to administer the MCAs to all of our students. Um, and it's understandable um, given the last year and the differences in learning environments that students would not necessarily be where we would expect them to be. And because of that, there have been some um, flexibility um, pieces provided by the federal government um, to address those concerns, but it does not alleviate the expectation that we would administer the MCA. 
Thank you, Dr. Che. I'm going to move quickly here so I can get through a bunch of these. Uh, Ansalt Library Media Specialist at Dayton's Bluff. How can an elementary teacher who is teaching virtually serve all students while with the supports that were given during virtual before return or in-person learning? There's no longer time for assistance to be part of morning meetings to assist with assessments or PBIS or parent updates. Um, just Anne goes on to talk about the number of hours she's putting on each day, uh, including weekends. And, and really finding it challenging to, to manage the differentiated needs. Thanks for the question. Uh, we recognize that the challenges of moving from, uh, from and into each scenario for uh, distance learning has been a challenge for, for many of us, uh, staff, uh, families, students for sure. And uh, each, each stage we've gone through in each scenario we've moved through has brought new challenges and you're uh, highlighting one of the other, one of the challenges that have come with in person. What we know is that our support staff should still have time, though not the same as you were in a full distance learning, to have time to do some supports for virtual students and for in-person students. And working uh, collaboratively with your, your support staff and your school leadership, there should be ways to, and we've seen ways where the support staff is able to have some dedicated time to support virtual learning students, as well as their in-person students. Of course, being in the same class at the same time, uh, as it was in distance learning has changed. And so those movements need to also change uh, at the school for the in-person and virtual learning going on. Appreciate the question and ask you to uh, continue to uh, advocate for your students to get the support they need and to work with your colleagues and leadership at the school to see how we can uh, manage the support for the students there. Great, thank you, Hans. Next question is Eliza Tosher, uh, ELL teacher at St. Anthony Park. When will staff receive N95 masks? Are they still impossible to come by? So again, uh, Eliza, I asked uh, Director Parent to share an update. Sorry here, everybody. I have lots of information in front of me. OK, so staff have access to N95 masks if their job requires it, based on guidance from the Minnesota Department of Health, as these are critical supplies for the healthcare industry. School districts do have limited access to N95 specifically. So it's important to ensure the ones we do have go to those whose jobs require it. Please note that there is a plethora of other PPE options to ensure staff can work safely, all based on the specific needs of your job. Let's see, next question is from Stacy at Global Arts Plus Upper. Our building is down five paraprofessionals. When will those positions be filled as it greatly impacts services to our special education students? Um, how can you help our middle school? We have a large number of special education students choosing to stay virtual, but also a large in the building. We do not have enough staff for both. How do we meet the IEP minutes of special education students when they're staying virtual? And how do we handle the situation if we do not have enough uh, special education staff in the building? So Superintendent, I, I'll, let me start with that. Jim Vollmer here from Human Resources. Uh, on the first part, we are in, and have been um, hiring as many paraprofessionals as we can to help in all of our buildings uh, with all of our uh, services that uh, they so wonderfully help us with and help our students with. We, um, we did meet yesterday and had a great conversation with uh, the business representatives that represent our uh, paraprofessionals and asked them to uh, help us in that recruitment to use the avenues that they have, the resources they have for recruitment. And they were more than happy to do that. And so we're partnering with them to try to make that happen, to get uh, higher levels of recruitment and get folks in uh, to meet the needs of all of our buildings and all of our students. Uh, one thing, if you do see folks or you hear of folks that uh, might be interested here, uh, as folks have come on and we're doing their uh, paperwork to get them hired, we are getting them signed up for a vaccination. So uh, this is something extra that we can really provide as a school district that other employers maybe cannot. We have that uh, wonderful opportunity. And so we have been taking advantage of that and doing that so that uh, new hires coming in can get uh, those vaccines as well but we are doing everything we can right now to get as many folks as we can. All employers out there are really struggling with hiring. Um, there's 
folks are reluctant uh, and rightfully so and understandably so uh, to maybe re-enter the workforce if they've been out of the workforce. And so that has been a bit of a um, difficulty, but we are hopeful that as more and more folks are getting those vaccines, that they'll be more willing to come back into the workforce and we'll get those positions filled and relieve some of the um, difficulties that you mentioned in your question. And I'll maybe turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Dow to answer the others. Thank you. Um, thank you, Stacy. Hopefully you were able to attend my session, my Q&A for secondary special educators on how do you staff uh, a partial day model and our students in Fed 3. And so it is different every building. It's about the final enrollment in VLS and in person and the accommodations that are approved within each building. And then we work with the building administrative team and the teacher team to talk about how can we make it work for staffing in person as well as VLS. And we, what we know about um, or what we learned from elementary schools is that if your caseload is split in half, it is very difficult to do both. So we need to come together as a team, look at the staffing and say, how do we support all the students with the IEP minutes being the priority? For Global Arts uh, Plus Upper and Lower, please know that uh, Larry Wren and I are meeting with your administration very soon to go over this and we will connect with the staff. Back to you, Superintendent. Great, thank you very much, Mr. Ulmer and Ms. Dowd, appreciate it. Um, next question, Elizabeth Sunby, Clerk at Indian Ed Program. Now, Elizabeth, you, uh, you shared a very uh, thorough list of questions and what I wanna share with you is um, I will ensure that our staff um, um, answer these and, and respond back to you personally uh, with many of them. Uh, a few that I would like to uh, to share though uh, before I move on to some of the other submissions is <clears throat> uh, asking a, some questions about next year. Questions about uh, will we still have safety measures in place once the pandemic is over? And you know it's interesting I came across some information today about when is the pandemic over? Uh, so this is a very uh, pertinent question uh, based on you know some of the information that I've seen. And the real answer to that is I don't know. I mean, there are many different stages of a pandemic, uh, you know, from zero cases, zero deaths and things like that, to different stages of herd immunity and what it might mean to uh, some of the safety measures that are in place. As I mentioned earlier, the governor tomorrow is expected at 11 a.m. to uh, share some of those uh, decisions that he is making based on uh, different indicators that, that he and his staff and the experts in the state in the country for that matter are, are looking at in terms of some of these uh, provisions. Uh, the one thing that I will say is that, you know, I, I think that anything we can do to proactively uh, use some of these safety measures, uh, not to the extent that it affects our programs, but to the effect that we can apply them, you know, I think we would be very wise to until um, every single person is offered the opportunity for a vaccine. And, and that's of all ages. And right now, of course, we're talking about only 18 and over, I believe. I don't think 17 year olds are in there. I may be corrected by a member of my team. Um, you know, so we'll be learning about uh, what it means for our, our uh, young adults in the, in the future as well. It leads me to the next question about will vaccines be required for students or staff in the future? As of right now, I'm not aware of it being a requirement um, or, or that being discussed. So I don't have any additional information about that. Um, I would imagine that there are many people wondering uh, about that. I can share with you that I've been a little bit surprised by the, uh, or I shouldn't say surprised, but it has caused me to look at some of the numbers in terms of um, how many people are opting not to uh, for a variety of reasons uh, to once they're offered a vaccine. And that, that's that been pretty consistent with my colleagues, both uh, here and far um, in terms of what they've experienced as well. So that tells me that we really do have to look at the safety measures that we have in place and how can we balance the safety measures with the restrictive uh, possible restrictions to the programs that we want to offer in St. Paul Public Schools and of course uh, find that balance. You know that we are in a very difficult position opening the school year with being anything but distance learning based on some of the things that we're dealing with right now. I mean the conversations we're having right now at this very moment were conversations I didn't feel we were ready to have in September. Uh, just in terms of numbers of students, where they go, transportation, uh, food. And, and again, that's not to say that our teams weren't ready, but when it's based on a prescribed number of students, I didn't feel confident that we would be able to, to turn that over to start our school year. So I won't go back too far with that because then I'll get stuck uh, taking you through the whole year. 
Um, but uh, Elizabeth, your questions are very important and I'll make sure that you get a response uh, to each of them. Next, we have Josh Leonard, Education Director at the Bellwin Outdoor Science, um, wondering where three feet of distancing came from. I thought six feet of distancing was safe. How does safety three feet of distancing compared to six feet of distancing? Where's the science supporting or not supporting three feet of distancing? Uh, again, questions about mask wearing and uh, the role that all of us have in ensuring that our students are not just wearing masks, but wearing them properly. Um, very important. We have to reinforce, we have to model, we have to remind, we have to uh, wrap our arms around that child's community, teachers, uh, families, uh, support staff at school, and make sure that we are complying with the mask policy. And then finally, how many SPPS classrooms have had a quarantine since the return to in-person teaching? So the first thing, in the uh, safe learning plan, there were two different iterations of modifications of the three feet minimal physical distancing. It was added first for the elementary um, re uh, in per return to in-person on December 17th. And on February 17th, the uh, similar language was added for secondary schools. And again, being uh, you know that it's strongly encouraged that there's a minimal of three feet of, of physical distancing. And look, I know that that is challenging. I've spent you know nearly 30 years in schools, uh, uh, elementary, middle, and high school, all, all three levels. And and I understand what spaces look like in schools. I've been a part of a big district before where not every building is the same, and I certainly know that to be true here in St. Paul Public Schools. Uh, so we do need to work very carefully to. Uh, to remind, to make sure that we're setting up uh, safe expectations and to make sure that we are making the proper adjustments uh, where we can. Uh, we don't have all that, you know, we can't be flexible in all of our environments. So we're going to have to uh, make some determinations of the best way to accomplish our goals and to do it as safely as possible. Uh, so that, that'll that be ongoing discussions as we move forward. Again, I am happy to say that cases in Ramsey County continue to be um, steady, steadily declining. Um, and um, very thankful for that. But you're right, we do continue to have COVID-19 impacting um, our schools and our community. And uh, though we don't have data that we're sharing on the number of classrooms that we're quarantining, we do share a, uh, uh, a dashboard weekly that updates on Sunday evenings that shows staff and students and the number of reports that we've had for either suspected or, or positive uh, COVID-19 reports, or, and then the actual positive cases uh, that we have as well. So that is data that's available on our Reopen SPPS webpage uh, for you to take a look. And you can see some interesting trends there as it relates to what COVID was like in the community and the corollary uh, data points uh, here in SPPS. <clears throat> uh, Carrie Bittner, English teacher at Murray. Ever since last spring, that when the shutdown started, there's been a directive for schools to create virtual learning for students. Schools that have been repeatedly asked to enroll, which they did, we are entering the second calendar year of shutdown and we still don't have a VLS for our families. Now starting in April, secondary buildings have to struggle to teach two formats, often to the detriment of both. So why haven't we created a virtual learning school? Um, I'll have uh, Executive Director Ott uh, also contribute to, to this response. Carrie, you know, again, we, we've talked a little bit about the differences in a true online school, which of course we've applied for, uh, we are not implementing right now. So we do not have an online school in St. Paul Public Schools. I do know some of my colleagues have talked very differently about some of the arrangements and the ability that they have to serve students because they have or and have had for several of them for, for many years, a true online, uh, full comprehensive online option uh, for their students. You know, I think even in that case, it's been stretched uh, during COVID-19. And, and even in those districts, they're not able to accommodate in the true online uh, fashion, uh, the kind of requests that they would have from all their students who are opting for virtual learning uh, per the state's um, uh, the state's mandate that we offer that for, for our students. So I want to be able to, to, to make sure that we are talking about, th that I'm talking about three different things here. Of course, in person, virtual learning, what are we offering St. Paul Public Schools, and then an online option that we don't have developed yet. Uh, that we are approved to and that we are working towards. So there is a little bit of a difference there. In our elementary uh, schools, you know, you know, we have several teachers that are able to teach in virtual and they're teaching grade, you know, grade levels and, and some split grade levels at a time. 
And in our second, with our secondary schedules, you know, we don't have the ability to create those um, replicated sections uh, that are virtual, um, especially at our high school and even in our middle school with a, a lot of our electives and our in our different disciplines. Uh, it's it, we're, we're not able to accommodate that. Um, if I was able to, um, you know, push a button and have SPPS staff grow uh, times two, and we're able to offer both staffing in, in, in those same environments, we would have that done. Um, but but we can't, and we're, and we're not able to accommodate that. Uh, so again, we're looking at our secondary levels, especially uh, to create, as I mentioned earlier, the opportunity for our students to be in both environments uh, with their teachers. And I understand the challenges uh, that that has. I understand uh, that that I am not able to, uh, to say to you and to direct you uh, to say you have to teach students that are in person and students who are virtual at the same time. I also understand that many of you have found ways to be very successful um, in, in doing that, in, in using some of the tools and strategies that, that, that you've accomplished. And it's, it's greatly appreciated and, and something that, uh, you know, that, that deserves you to, to continue to have support uh, to do if you're able to. Uh, but I also understand that that isn't going to be possible for all students uh, to be there throughout the day um, at every scheduled time. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the expectation for all staff. So we wanted to create that time in the afternoons and that time on Fridays. So there could be a time for there to be some intentional uh, reach out and work with uh, students who are in, in virtual learning. I understand it is not going to be perfect. I understand it is not going to be ideal, but right now those are the models that we have as we continue to develop uh, what a true online school option would be for our students. In the meantime, uh, teachers and staff, I can't say enough how much I appreciate the work that you're doing. Some of you never in a million years would have wanted to teach online. Some of you have been waiting for opportunities to do it perhaps, uh, but those are, are, are choices that we should have in our system and not be mandates that you're forced to do or, or that we have to do in reaction to, a, uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, I'm up to Chua Vang, uh, school counselor at Como Park Senior High School. Uh, the first question is, will the expectation be that all students who opt in for in-person learning and secondary must be in the building at the same time Monday through Thursday, or can buildings plan to have a certain grade level in the building to help reduce the exposure in the classrooms and hallway? I believe Executive Director Ott, you were gonna. Yeah, yeah I can address that, thank you. Uh, just to touch base a little bit on Ms. Bittner's uh, topic before as well, we really appreciated the the staff, uh, building leader and district leader input uh, from June and July and throughout the fall and trying to uh, address and pivot and plan for each stage of virtual learning for all the students uh, in the district. And we know that those shifts have been hard and we do appreciate that we were able to engage with uh, various folks across the district to to make the best decision we could to keep kids on track to graduate. And uh, Dr. Gothard, you, you explained the rest very clearly. Uh, in terms of uh, those opting for in-person and coming in at different times, as Dr. Gothard said earlier, we want students in the building. We really feel that uh, we want uh, the option for kids to uh, to come in and get support and engage in learning every day that they're in school. Just get my head back on track here for a second, so I appreciate the, the moment. Uh, we have building leadership teams and staff are going to continue to work through April 14th start date to make sure students can be present in the building safely. Uh, one of the strategies that we've heard is that some schools are going to look at having uh, some staggered passing time, so uh, not all students are in the hallway at exactly the same time to allow some distance uh, between students. There are strategies like that and many more that will arise between now and April 14th and beyond to adjust and pivot to accommodate the students to be in school. But uh, at this time, all schools will have the students in the school Monday through uh, Thursday and uh, not have those alternating days for kids to come in. Great, thank you so much, Hans. And this is gonna be our final question, everyone. And Chu, uh, I should say, Chu, I know you had some other questions as well, and I will uh, be sure that we're able to address those and, and get those shared with both you and for, for others as well. They're uh, very good questions. Uh, the final question is from Shelley Fountain, social worker at Gordon Parks. I appreciate the items that have been provided to help our students, families, and staff to keep our 
students, families, and staff safe. My question is, can we provided, be provided with Lysol spray for our individual classrooms and offices to spray after each class period and one-on-ones in the support staff's offices? Principals, counselors, nurses, behavioral specialists, and social workers. Uh, Director Parent shared the following. Every classroom and office space is provided with disinfectant wipes. I have mine right here. And staff are welcome to request a spray bottle with disinfectant. Additionally, if they desire, please work with your building's head engineer to get those supplies. We are not recommending nor using any aerosolized sprays or disinfectants other than what our custodial staff are using um, after everyone else has gone home for the day. Um, so again, please follow up with your specific building site and your head engineer uh, for um, additional information. And with that, everyone, I want to say, uh, first of all, thank you for the great questions and, and the engagement. Um, I, you know, I, I have to go back to March 15, 2020. Uh, for those of you who don't have a calendar in front of you, especially for the last year, that was a Sunday morning. Uh, and being called into a press conference with uh, officials from the Department of Education and Health and Governor Walls on, a, um, on that Sunday morning, I believe it was 10 in the morning. Um, where he shared that he was going to close Minnesota schools as uh, many districts around our states and districts around the country were doing the same. Um, if you would have told me that, you know, almost a year later we would be where we are, um, I, I don't know that I would have believed it. Um, you know, we were, uh, COVID-19 was, was a word we were hearing on the news. It had not greatly impacted our local community at that time. And uh, it has been um, just, just absolutely incredible what we've gone through and endured as a, as a community through this time. And uh, it isn't lost on me at all. And uh, what I want you to know is that I think many times our community and especially our staff, you know, might think that it is, you know, one person, your superintendent, me, uh, making decisions that aren't informed. Um, and, and what I want you to know, and, and the reason that I wanted to bring members of the team here to be with you tonight is, um, these are excellent colleagues that I get to work with every day and partner with, and they push me. Uh, they push me to think through things. They um, they they question recommendations. Uh, they take guidance that we get from the state, and they say, "How can we make this happen in St. Paul Public Schools?" And and they come through. And uh, when as a team, when we're not right or when we're not in agreement, we seek out others to partner with us. So I want to right now share with you um, that we also partner with a regional support team from St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health, from the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota Department of Health. And they have been invaluable partners for us um, in, in all the work that we've done. Sometimes they share information with us. They come to us with updates. They come to us with concerns. Um, other times uh, they check in and they just want to know or we want to go to them to just have them hear us out. Um, and many times, as you know, in the Metro, uh, we're fortunate. We have 45 districts that are, you know, not all similar to St. Paul, but a lot of the operations and things that we're doing, there's a lot of similarities in terms of uh, what we can learn from one another. Uh, so it's been a, a great support network for us. Um, of, of course, you can find districts that are far away from us and what we're doing, and you can find others that are more like us. Um, but I, I, I just, I can't thank the team enough um, who are with me tonight. If you participated last night in the family, uh, for them as well. Uh, just really appreciate the work that they're doing. And, and again, it, it's really in support of you. We want, uh, you know, we want the experiences for our students to be the very best uh, that they can. And, and I believe that shifting to an in-person model um, is what our students need right now who choose to. And I want to support our staff to, to be able to do their very best and to do it uh, safely as well. So we will continue to transition through here. Please don't think that dates on a calendar mean that it's done on that day and we don't continue to engage and reach out and learn and adjust and, and find different ways to support. Um, and, and please also know that if I didn't trust and really believe in the work that you can do, I would never make this recommendation that we come back in person. It is because of the incredible faith I have in you, uh, the incredible professionalism that I've seen um, over the last year and some of the most difficult and challenging times that I think any school district in the country has faced. Um, you have stood up and you've stood proud. Uh, you've spoken your truth in your mind uh, in what you believe is the best for students, for families, and, and for your community. And for that, I'm grateful. It doesn't mean that we're always going to agree, but you've heard me say many times, I will never ever back away from how much you care uh, about this school district. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you all. 
Um, I hope you have a wonderful evening and a, a great Friday. And again, continued safety and health and uh, keep working in service of students the way that you have. I know that they will benefit and that they do benefit because of it. Thank you and good night, everyone.